Hi everyone. I'm here today to talk to you about AI search, uh, but doing it within your existing database. So there's a couple of things, AI based retrieval, a general background on how that works. Neural hashing, which is uh, my favorite method for doing AI search. And then we're going to see how this works when you plug it into some common databases, such as MySQL, SQLite, and Postgres. My name is Hamish. I'm the VP of AI at Algolia. Uh, my background was originally in physics, designing lasers, but uh, more recently I've been spending time on AI and ML powered search. AI search, uh, understanding meaning instead of matching keywords. I think the the way to think about this is keyword searches like matching indexes in the back of a book, whereas uh, AI search is trying to match the meaning. And so you're turning text into mathematics and trying to match on the actual meaning of the text instead of just matching on the word. Uh, looking at an example here, get humidity out of my apartment. This is an example where keyword search fails, but vector search successfully retrieves a relevant product. And so the key thing to, to note here is that there's two different types of retrieval going on, the keyword search and the vector search. And vector search is uh, essentially trying to find the most similar things in, in meaning. So the query and the items are both converted into vectors and you're looking to find similar things. Breaking that down, uh, the way to think about it is your text is getting converted into uh, vectors via an AI model. And then you're looking in the vector space here shows two dimensions. But actually, in real life, we use hundreds of dimensions that come from the, the AI models. And you can see here that there's a product lookup and the dehumidifier is closer to the query in this case than the electric toothbrush, which is what we would expect to see. That sounds great. But when practically speaking, you want to try to find the most similar vectors in high dimensional space, it's not an easy problem. And there's a couple of trade-offs here. The, the speed, precision, and affordability. The industry joke is you can only pick two. Uh, which is fairly fairly true. So you have to mind your trade-offs. And then the other thing to note here is that existing databases don't have good support for vector style indexes. And so quite often this requires a duplication into a second data store, which is not, not ideal. We like neural hashes because they're a great balance of trade-offs. We think they're the best balance of trade-offs. And then second reason is we think that they they integrate really well into existing data stores. And if you want to see how they work, essentially you're taking the, the vector representations, passing it through another neural network, which outputs binary. And so these ones and zeros, think of it as a binary vector. But when we're doing searching, we're trying to find how many of the ones and zeros overlap between the query and the items that you're searching. And so in this case, again, we can see the, the frigid air product is closer uh, to the query than the electric toothbrush, which is again, what we'd expect to see. But basically the key difference here is that you're looking at binary instead of looking at floating point numbers. In a general sense, uh, databases already understand binary, which is fantastic. And these two main bitwise operations here, XOR and pop count, are what you need to integrate neural hashes into any data store. And you can see from this table here that most common uh, databases and data stores already support these. And so it's just a matter of working out how to wire it in. So you send your text or images or content to the Algolia inference API. We return hashes and then you load them in and the, you use the XOR and pop count for the query traversal. Jumping into an example, this one's for SQLite. In the middle here, this green part is the hash. And so here the, the query text has been converted into the hash uh, and it's being represented as a hex string. Effectively, we're, we're searching and comparing it against all of the other hashes in the product database for each of the products. And then we're going to look for a threshold of 0.6. We're gonna return 10 items and then we're gonna join this onto the products table and return the results to the user. So it looks a little bit convoluted, but it actually works really well in practice. So MySQL, fairly similar. Uh, the, the difference here, you've got a placeholder instead of actually showing the hash in this example, the caret is the XOR and the bit count uh, function is what's doing the pop count. Similar for Postgres, uh, the hash in this case is doing the, the XOR and then you have the bit count function again, which is doing the, the, the pop count. But relatively uh, simple to integrate. Like I said, a little bit convoluted because you've got to do some type switching, but uh, not too bad. We have a half a million product set from Amazon catalog. It's about five gigabytes in size. 
we've run that through the Algolia inference service already and added the hashes into a separate table. Now we're going to look at that in a few different ways. So firstly, we're going to look at it from a UI standpoint and just see some of the queries running in real time. And then we're going to jump in from an SQL standpoint and take a look at some of the queries and see what's going on behind the scenes. So here we are on the demo UI, um, big bag of cheese. Not sure we want that. Uh, let's try something else. Toys for toddlers. So you can see here you're doing, it took about a hundred milliseconds. This is running locally on, on my MacBook. So we've run this uh, Toys for Toddlers as a vector search query across half a million products, around a hundred milliseconds, not too bad. You can play around with this. Uh, let's talk about an espresso machine. This is actually a mistake though. A lot of people say this, but you, you should actually say espresso machine but it still finds things, which is interesting. Here we've got espresso machines, which is what you'd expect to see. Uh, coffee machine. You can see here, it's also pretty tolerant to things like spelling mistakes. That's actually the um, vector model itself. There's no spell correct actually used in this. Just because you're seeing these common misspellings in real life, they actually do vectorize to something that's quite meaningful, which is interesting. Uh, so here we're looking at coffee machine. Uh, let's say we want espresso ones. So we see espresso machines uh, with the milk thing, for those who like milk in their coffee. And so this is an example where you would normally get poor performance when you're thinking about a keyword style search. You'd have to have a lot of fallback and everything for this, this kind of query to work. But here you can see these are all espresso coffee machines with a milk thing, uh, which is exactly what we want to see. So this is just an example to show how we can do this kind of search locally. This is all being powered via SQLite uh, database. And so we're gonna jump in and run some of these queries in SQL as well, just to see how it works. Okay, so jumping into the SQLite interface here, this is, this is on my local machine. Uh, just showing you, we have over half a million product hashes here in this table. So it's around a five gig database, as I mentioned, but you can see over half a million items in here. So now we're going to do the query that we just did, the coffee machine espresso with the milk thing. Um, I have that here already with the hash. And so this is the hash you can see that's running against the database. That's the representation of the query. And then you can see the results down the bottom here. This query took uh, 99 milliseconds to run over the half million products. This is a full scan query. So we're not using any index lookups here, which I'll come back to in a second. So just running a second query here, I'll do the, the one that we started out with the toys for toddlers. Again, it's around this sort of hundred millisecond time. You can see you get results as you would expect. We're only looking at the, the top five here, but you could return as many as you want. You could change the threshold. You can basically do anything that you want to do uh, in normal SQL world, which is kind of cool. So this is vector search, but in SQLite. Interestingly here, the full scan, 100 milliseconds. Why are we doing a full scan? You might wonder why we're doing a full scan and why we're not using index lookups. So we're going to go into that a little bit. But firstly, what I want to do here is a uh, a query. So this particular query is selecting the, the product ID and the name where the name equals, and we've used the, the top result here for this query. So we're basically, we, we know we're just trying to find that one record, but we want to see how long does a full scan take. And in this case, it took three seconds to go and run that query. That's, that's a little bit slower than I would expect. So I'll run it again. And here you're seeing it's taking over half a second to do an exact match on a text field. So a full scan on the database, half a second. So interestingly here, when you're looking at comparing the hashes, you're more than five times faster than doing a, uh, a text match on a field in the database. So that kind of gives you a feel for how quick it is. It's a very, very quick operation to do, uh, but obviously we can do better. And so one of the things that comes with neural hashes that we haven't got into so far 
is this concept of a, a index identifier. And so I'll run this same query here again, except there's a couple of extra components in here. And this main bit here that I'm highlighting is the important thing that we need to look at. And these are basically when you do a neural hash, you not only do you get the hash back, but you also get uh, what we call index identifiers, which are essentially the neurons in a particular layer of the network that are the most activated. And why that's important is when you see similar things, similar neurons actually become uh, activated. And so we can use those as kind of cheat codes to look up in the vicinity and get a, a set of candidates to look at instead of doing a full scan. So this example here, we have uh, eight uh, index identifiers that we're looking up and you can see it's actually slower. This is instead of being under 100 milliseconds, we're closer to half a second. I'll just run it again just to make sure. And yeah, we're seeing consistently around this sort of 460 milliseconds to run this. So even though we've used the, uh, the index lookups here to reduce the amount that we're scanning, we're paying an extra cost on the join, which is uh, outweighing using the lookup. So that's using eight though, but I want to see what happens if instead of using eight, if we use one. Uh, so that's the case here. And you might notice if I scroll back up here, we, we have eight, but these are actually in order. And so 503 is the, the strongest uh, neuron interaction that we saw. And so scrolling down, we're going to run just look up where the product IDs are in 503. And here you can see we're actually getting back down to the 100 milliseconds. And interestingly, I don't know if you, you probably haven't been paying too much attention to the results, but these results are exactly the same as what we saw with the full scan. And so interesting here, we've looked at a small fraction of the data. Uh, we're getting the same results, which is interesting. So that shows that these index identifiers do allow us to cheat and not do as many hash evaluations when we're running a query. But interestingly, it's still just as slow. I'm blaming that on uh, my SQLite skills. And I think that the, the join here can be a lot more efficient. This should be a lot faster. We see when we run this local outside of a database that we're around 10 times faster, 10 to 20. So we should be completing this query in around the five milliseconds. Thinking about index identifier 503. So we can run this query here, which is basically, I'll just scroll up. We want to browse the content cluster. And so in this case, we're basically saying select everything where the IID is 503. And then we're going to browse that, that content cluster. So we're going to show the top 10 uh, in that content cluster. Because what we want to see, uh, we took this from the query where we were looking up toys for toddlers. And so we want to actually have an understanding, is this a content cluster around toys for toddlers? Because if it is, that also has other useful properties where we can do things like auto classification of uh, text. We can automatically put it in categories and things like that. And what you'll see is that some of these, like the first one, yes. Uh, second one, maybe. We got a mix here. Third one, not really. Uh, but there, there is kind of like some relationship in these, but this is not just uh, kids' toys, definitely not just kids' toys. But you do see a bunch of things in here that are related to kids' toys. So just to get a feel out of the half a million products, we can run another query and actually have a look to see how many things, I'll bring this up a bit, how many items are there in the content cluster 503. Turns out there's 30,000 items in this particular content cluster. So that's interesting because you're looking at, you know, we have about 520,000 items in this database. Uh, and of those 30,000 of them are in this particular content cluster. So what you find is some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. And, but generally you'll find that the, the content overlap is uh, useful. So that's just an example to show you how we can come in here and 
uh, use neural hashes in a database like SQLite. I don't think it's optimized um, by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's it's quite conceivable that even with half a million products on your local machine, you can get SQLite queries down to the, the single digit milliseconds. So I think it's a great example of, of what is possible. And we're really looking forward to bringing this into all databases. Moving on to thinking about like, we get this question all the time, how does this compare to vector databases? And so it's quite interesting to see this in um, thinking about trade-offs. The first one is uh, RAM usage. Vector databases keep around the full vectors. They basically have to keep them in memory to go fast. And neural hashes on the other hand are about a 20th of the size of the vectors. And so you're seeing you know, 95% reduction in RAM usage just for the vector index component. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that you don't need to have an extra database running and duplication of metadata, all the filtering and other things that you need. That's quite interesting. Speed's pretty much a wash. They both get to pretty high speed and throughput at scale. Recall, slight advantage to vector databases because they keep the vectors around. Uh, they can get right down to you know, accuracy levels in ordering that is not possible neural hashes. But in practice, we find that that's actually not uh, an issue in real world applications. We've got some full benchmarks coming out soon to explain why. CRUD support and workflow, obviously these are both a huge win from neural hash and database standpoint. CRUD support mainly because you can do everything you can do in a database and it just works. Uh, in vector databases, that's not the case. There's support for updates and deletes is so-so. And uh, many of them also, you need all the data up front. Uh, they don't vacuum and uh, collapse in on space. And lots of other features that you're used to with CRUD support that databases just handle well. So there's a big advantage there in workflow. Obviously, if you're working within your existing database, you don't need to manage the replication and synchronizing of data to somewhere else. So there's huge uh, advantages there and you don't have to run uh, other infrastructure. So big win there as well. For those who want to try this, we are opening up an early access program. We're working with a few companies already and we'd love to have more people on board, get more feedback, see what you like, see what you don't like. So please use this QR code or send your feedback and uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. <music>